today, week seven of our nine-week series on being naturally supernatural, looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to take a quick look at the gift of prophecy. And uh, no doubt all of you will have an idea as to what prophecy is, um, and I'll, I'll, I, may, I may kind of... Um, bamboozle you with some, some different definitions to what you think prophecy is, but in the, in the whole framework of things, you're right anyway. But listen to how I'm going to communicate this, and, um, and, and you'll, I'm sure you'll see this is going to be interesting. And w- the one thing I want us to say before anything else is that every single Christian is called to prophesy. It's not just for the other person. It's, not, it's for every Christian. Now, is that clear? If you forget everything else, remember that, because God wants you to prophesy. So prophecy, remember we're looking at the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. All of these gifts are supernatural. And prophecy is a supernatural message or utterance in a known tongue. In other words, in a tongue that we all understand, which is English. Most of us, some of you I know speak different languages as well, but in this congregation, in English. Prophecy. Prophecy is mentioned both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, it was written in Greek, and the Greek word for prophecy is prophemi, two words, a compound word, Pro meaning before or in front of, and phemi, which means to speak. The Hebrew word in the Old Testament, there are two Hebrew words actually, naba and nataf. And naba means to bubble up or to pour forth, and nataf means to drop or to distill. So if we pull all of those things together, prophecy is a supernatural utterance that bubbles up within you and is spoken before other people. That's what prophecy is. So now I've told you I can sit down. Okay. <laughs> you, you will remember when we started this series that we were looking at the, the nine gifts that split themselves into three groups of three. The three uh, gifts of revelation, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. The three gifts of demonstration the gift of faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healing. And now we're looking at the three gifts of inspiration, prophecy, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. So today it's prophecy. Now, <clears throat> prophecy is the first of these gifts and is the leading gift of the inspirational gifts. And the reason why that is the case is because it takes the other two for this to work. See, giving tongues and interpreting tongues is the same as giving a prophecy, but bypassing that and prophesying directly. And so those two equal this one. And Paul gives a very clear direction in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 5, and he says this to the church at Corinth, but I would rather have you prophesy. He said, I speak in tongues more than you all, but I would rather have you prophesy. He put great emphasis on prophecy. So remember what I said, every Christian is called to be prophetic. You know, the church is prophetic in two ways. We are, did you know, we are the prophetic voice of God to the world. So prophecy has two different ways of manifesting itself. Prophecy can be released when we, the church, come together like this on a Sunday morning. But also, we, the church, are called to be God's prophetic voice to the world. How are people going to hear about God unless we tell them? So we've got to understand that prophecy is about more than what happens in a meeting on a Sunday morning. In fact, I would go as far as to say it should be, that should be the less part of prophecy. Prophecy should be a part of us so much that we prophesy not only to one another, but to people who don't even know Jesus. Now, there's a way of doing that, and you'll be expounding some of that, looking at that in your life groups later on this week. 
So what we need to realize here is that Paul puts great emphasis. In fact, he mentions the word prophecy or its equivalent 22 times in chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians. Okay, so we've, I'm going to go with the same outline as with the others. What are the misinterpretations? What is prophecy not? Well, the first thing we've got to make clear is that we've got to not confuse it with the office of the prophet. Now, here's where I might cause you some kind of cause to think, and I'll explain what I mean by this. In the simple gift of prophecy, there is no revelation. How many of you thought prophecy is all about end times? Because it's not. I'll explain what I mean by that. That's not to say that revelation can be communicated through the avenue of prophecy. You will remember that the first gift that we looked at was the word of wisdom. And then there was the word of knowledge. But the word of wisdom is presenting facts that are in the future, facts of the mind of God. So within the delivery of a prophecy, there could be some predictive elements to it or some things to do with the future, but that is actually the word of wisdom being released through a prophetic message. So I hope I'm not confusing you now, but actually we call that all prophecy, and it is all being prophetic, but in the simple gift of prophecy, there is no revelation. It's one of the other gifts that are included as well. Now, I want to make this point because it, there arises or can arise great confusion about the prophet's ministry. You know, the fact that somebody prophesies does not make that person a prophet. And of necessity, the prophet must have operating with him or her at least two of the other gifts of revelation. A prophet will also operate the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom at least not every time he prophesies. I'm using the word he as generic ladies, okay? All of us. <clears throat> but all prophets prophesy, but not everybody who prophesies is a prophet. All Christians are called to seek that they may prophesy, but not all Christians are called to be prophets. In fact, when you read towards the end of 1 Corinthians 12, it says that he has given first some apostles, second prophets, third teachers. So there are a different category of gifts given to the body of Christ. Now, let me take this one step further, and then I'll leave it where it is. But there's a great difference between prophecy and the prophet. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10, we are looking at the gift of prophecy. <clears throat> and it says there to that the Holy Spirit gives severally as he wills. In this occasion, a person has a gift. So in any of these nine gifts, the Holy Spirit will give you a gift, and you have that gift. The word gift in 1 Corinthians 12 for, is, is the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, from which we get our English word charismata or charismatic. We are a charismatic church, and charismatic means that we, we see a manifestation of the Holy Spirit at work as he uses and gives gifts to each one of us. That's what being charismatic is all about. So in 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of prophecy is given to you. Now in Ephesians 4 and, uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 8... Of course, further down in verse 11, it says he's given some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be teachers. But in verse 8, it says the, the risen Christ, Jesus, as he ascended, gave gifts of men to the church. Now, the word gift there in Ephesians 4 is a different Greek word to the word in 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, it's charis, charismata. But in this time... It's a different Greek word. It's the Greek word doma, D-O-M-A. And that occasion, Jesus has given the gift of that person to the church. 
In fact, when you look at the, at the ministry gifts of Christ, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, those five gifts are given for the, for the edifying of the body of Christ for the work of the ministry. So in other words, those gifts are gifts themselves to the body of Christ. In other words, in 1 Corinthians 12, one has a gift. In Ephesians 4, the other is a gift. Now, the fact is, not all of us are going to be prophets, but all of us should prophesy. Okay? This is not positional, by the way. It's functional. It's about doing what God wants us to do. And Paul tells the whole church at Corinth to desire the spiritual gifts, but especially to covet prophecy. Amazing. He said that after just mentioning in chapter 12 that he's first set in the church, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers. He said, are all apostles? The answer to that is no. Are all prophets? The answer to that is no. They couldn't be, otherwise Paul would be contradicting himself here. But because he says, I want you all to prophesy. But not everybody's a prophet. So I want you to notice as well in 1 Corinthians 14, 29 to 30, it says if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, in other words, to another prophet, then the first speaker should stop. And he's talking there about revelation. That's one of the other gifts of, of the Holy Spirit that is being released. And I'm making that point because, you know, some people get so bound with titles. We don't need titles. You don't need to be called I, I, you know, I remember coming here the very second week after we were inducted. I said, don't anybody ever call me pastor because that's not what I am. Now, I pastor, but that's not my main gift. My main gift actually is prophetic. Secondly, it's apostolic. So I have a prophetic gift, but I live with an apostolic call. Now, of course, I pastor. Of course, I evangelize. And of course, I teach. But my name is not Pastor Phil. I was raised up in a, in a church where the pastor was only referred to as pastor. Yeah. And it was almost like a name. So we, we don't go around and say, um, Nurse Janine, how are you doing today? You know, or, or, or Apple Supervisory Shalina, how are you today? Or, you know, Fireman Sam or Carpenter Fred. We don't call people by, their, by what they do. We give them their name. Now, did you think by me not being called pastor, although that's my function, we automatically we think the leader of a church is a pastor. It's not necessarily the case. It could be an evangelist. Mark Hughes is the leader of Church of the Rock. He's an evangelist. That's what he does. He has other people who do the pastoring. Now he does pastor. But the point I'm saying is if we're not careful, we can hide behind a title. Have you ever seen people with these business cards? You know, and it's almost like Bishop Fred or, or Dr. This. Or, I'm, not, I'm not against titles, don't get me wrong. But it's almost like if you, if you say that, you're giving credibility behind who you are. Do you know what? Jesus just wants us to be ourselves. He wants us to do what he has called us to do without hiding behind a lectern or a, or a title or anything like that. And do you know... If we really get to understand that, we will be totally freed from the bondage of expectations of others. So, okay, said enough on that one. <laughs> None of that was in my notes, by the way. But anyway, second one, prophecy is not prediction. Prophecy does not have the power to predict the future. And if there is any element of prediction, then it's the word of wisdom that's operating. It's interesting to notice, actually, the difference between Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy. Old Testament prophecy is essentially foretelling. But New Testament prophecy strongly moves from foretelling to forthtelling. There's no hint of any prediction in the spiritual, scriptural definition of prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14.3. We'll come to that in a minute. Thirdly, prophecy is not preaching. With all the gifts, we've got to make sure that we understand that nine gifts are all supernatural, including this one. And if we were to call prophecy the same as preaching, then we would rob that gift of its supernatural quality and character. The word preach literally means to announce, to proclaim, to tell, to herald, to cry. 
However, it's possible, and it is indeed often the case, that when a preacher is preaching, there could be a prophetic flow that's released, and some prophetic dimension inspirationally is included in that, but the act of preaching is not prophesying. Okay? This is an important one. Prophecy does not replace the Word of God. The content of the prophetic word is subject totally to the spirit of the one giving it. Therefore, it's not in itself infallible. That means that you, you can't be wrong. Yeah. See, we're, how, many of you, how many perfect people do we have here? <laughs> Apart from Yvonne. <laughs> She's never wrong. <laughs> now, let's be honest. How many perfect? None of us are perfect. Why? Because we're human beings. It's part of our nature. But the Bible is perfect. It is infallible. We can't take anything away from it. We can't add to it. It is the authoritative, total, absolute, infallible Word of God. Okay? So we've got to be careful here because... Sometimes people can tend to put prophecy on the same level as the Bible. But all prophecies are not necessarily correct. Sometimes it can be wrong. The very first time I was involved in a prophetic gathering of prophets where I was prophesying over people publicly was in a church in Nuneaton, 300 people. And I had to replace Keith Hazel, who, who was the prophet in the three prophets uh, with... Um, David Blomgren and, and Bob Perigallo. But Keith's father died, and he had to go and sort out his father's business. And Keith said, Phil, I want you to go and stand in my place. This was in 1986. So this was my first op operation, first occasion of prophesying publicly before people, over people, in a, what we call them presbyteries then. We didn't change the name now, but we're a, pr a prophetic gathering. So, so this is what happened. So we, two people were brought out, sat on chairs, 300 people watching, we've been worshipping the Lord. Then the first prophet goes and prophesies over the two of them. Then the second one goes, right? Well, David Blomgren, he's now with Jesus, great teacher, great prophet. He has been here years ago. How many of you remember David Blomgren? I can't remember who he is, but he came years ago. And uh, <clears throat> so, so he went and he was like, it's like Keith Hazel. When they prophesy, you think, well, what else, what else can you say? Everything's been said, you know. So it was fantastic. And then Bob Perigallo went and he started prophesying. And as he was prophesying, the pastor called me and Dave together and he says, Look, now remember, this is my first, first occasion. For, and I hadn't even prophesied yet. He said, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand some of this. I don't think it's right. I don't witness with some of it. So after they'd finished prophesying, he gathered, them, he gathered us together. We sang another song, told the couple to stay there. So they stopped sit, kept sitting there. And uh, Dave Blomgren, who was the lead prophet, said to the four of us in this little huddle, they, he says, look, Bob, uh, John, the pastor, John King, has found this, this wanting, and we, we, we want you to retract what you've said because John felt that it was, it was not quite right. It was wrong. So the meeting started. I'm thinking, oh, dear me. This is heavy stuff. So then John, uh, sorry, Bob had to get to the church and said, I, I've been asked to withdraw some of those remarks. If I acted in the flesh, I fully apologize. I want you to know that my heart is to do the right thing. And I gladly retract those things because the pastor of the church has asked me to do that. And uh, I gladly submit to that. Right? Now, in the meantime, do you think that undermined the prophetic not at all it did the opposite it gave credibility to it because it was being judged in the meantime I was wetting myself here because <laughs> it was my turn to go next and I hadn't even started but the point is prophecies can be wrong you know when we listen to a basic prophecy we must always take the gist of what's being said and not dwell on the word for word that's being said now some specifics can be really important i understand that but if we're not careful we can make prophecy like the like the bible i know of some people who carry their personal prophecies written out in the flyleaf of their bible as if it's part of their bible yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
God's word alone is our final place of authority. That's what we've got to understand. Although it is amazing how some things do come to pass later on. I'll just give you an illustration of this. Um, two weeks ago, our first Sunday in Canada, I was speaking in Cranbrook. This was just before Luke came out. And <coughs> I've been there a few times. And one of the elders, Dwayne, came to me after the meeting and he said, Phil, he said, uh, do you remember what you prophesied over me two years ago? I said, no, Dwayne, I don't know. So he started to proceed to tell me. And I'm only telling you this to, to show you that some things come later on, okay? He said, you prophesied, I got a business, and this guy is this amazing business of these, you know, these great trucks that dig up earth, and you know, these great big monster trucks that he's, he's got a business doing that. And uh, so he's a dirt mover. <laughs> and... Uh, very busy, being quite successful. Well, I apparently prophesied to him, and he reminded me. He said, you said that God is going to give me an, another business. And this new business, will you won't even have to go looking for it. It will come knocking at your door, and it will happen within three months. Right? Apparently, that's what I said. So he said... Um, he says, you will never guess what happened. Three months to the day, I was sitting in my office, and there was a knock at the door. So he in walked this guy, and this guy said, uh, Dwayne, I want to put something to you. He said, I'm getting older. I have a business, and I want you to have the business. I just want you to have it. All I need you to do, and his business was a, a wood chipping business. And he had bought two machines, one for $60,000, the other, the other for $40,000. There was a year's lease left on it. He said, if you give me $10,000 for each machine and pay the year's lease, he said, the business is yours. He said, now, I don't know whether you know much about BC, but it's a, it's a lumber country. They, they chop trees down, and they, it's just amazing. So this, this machine is the biggest, best wood chipper in the whole of British Columbia. <laughs> so, so he said, uh, so he said, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, he said, I, it's an offer I couldn't turn down, so I, I did it, he said. And um, then when I looked at, what, at that prophecy, it was three months to the day that the guy came knocking at the door. He said, we haven't, we haven't looked back. It's just grown. Yeah. Isn't that fantastic? So you never know when you start to move out in faith and say things. You might be wrong, but and if you're wrong, you humble yourself, apologize, and have the right heart and spirit. But, you, but if you are prompted by the Spirit of God, it encourages and lifts people up. Next thing is, prophecy is not for guidance. This is important. This is something that we've got to be careful about because especially with the restoration of this, this gift in these days, a lot of people come to prophecy asking God for a word. And, bet you've done it. <laughs> Give me a word. Have you got a word for me? Right? It's a very dangerous precedent. Prophecy is not given for guidance. The number of times that I'm in meetings when, uh, you know, I might have prophesied over a couple of people and, um, or whatever, and then at the end of the meeting, then somebody comes to say, would you pray for me? What they're really asking is, will you prophesy over me and give me a word? That's really what they're saying. Very often I'll say to people like that, well, yeah, well, how would you like me to pray for you? And uh, then they think, well, you know, whatever comes to you. <laughs> because people are looking to the man for a word from God. We don't need to do that. Where we need to go is to the word of God. You do not need a prophet to tell you what to do. The Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We are led by the Holy Spirit. Now, a prophet can confirm and add to all of that, but we need to really make sure we understand those things. Let me move on quickly. There's loads of examples in the Bible. In the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 11 was a, a, a phenomenal example of Moses um, 
and, and the time of Moses where prophecy descended. There was that great prophetic word in Joel 2.28 that in the last days your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams and your old men will have visions. I'll let you decide which category you fit into there, right? And then uh, Elisha prophesied. Actually, when in 2 Kings 3.15... He was asked to, to prophesy. You know, the first thing he did was he called for a minstrel. There's something about worship and the prophetic that are tied closely together. Worship releases the prophetic. And very often in a worship service like this, God, the best, po- the best way of the prophetic being released is God speaking to you directly. So that as you're worshiping the Lord, something comes to your mind. It's not necessarily you thinking of things Be open to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are occasions when somebody may get up and say something, but actually, the most dynamic thing is to hear God for yourself. But worship leads the way. So, Elisha said, before I I prophesy, call for the minstrel. So, he called for the minstrel, and he prophesied. What do you think happened to King David as the boy, you know, when he, after he fought Goliath, and Saul brought him into his presence, and, and, um, and he used to play the harp. And Saul was troubled with, a, with an evil spirit, it says. And when that happened, Saul, uh, David used to play the harp and the spirit calmed down. Why was that? It was because there was something of a release of the prophetic. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul, the king, on one occasion found himself walking with a group of prophets. And to be a prophet in the Old Testament, you had to learn a musical instrument. It was part of their school of the prophets. Because worship and prophecy go hand in hand. And as he was walking with these prophets, they were worshipping and prophesying. And Paul, uh, Saul started to prophesy because he was in the same environment. Yeah. King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, just coming to me now, when they went to fight out the enemy, they sent the singers first instead of the army. Why did they send the singers first? It was because the power of praise defeats the enemy. <laughs> it was amazing. In the children of Israel, when they went through the, 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 the wilderness, Judah went first. And Judah means praise. So praise went first before everything else. In Revelation, it talks about worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In Psalms, it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So as we begin to worship the Lord, we create a throne for God to inhabit and he pours down and speaks to us. Prophetic release. So worship goes hand in hand with that. In the New Testament, loads of scriptures. Acts 2, Peter on the day of Pentecost gets up and prophesies. Acts 11, Agabus prophesies. Again, Acts 21, Agabus prophesies again. Jesus, I'm just taking illustrations out of all of the Gospels. Matthew 24, concerning the last days. Mark 9, Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, (laughs) making a declaration. John 15, about the true vine. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Now, it's manifestation. How is prophecy released? What what, what happens then? Well, the usual way of prophecy being released is spontaneously. It happens when a person is released without any premeditated thought... And usually, an inspiration floods into that person's mind, and they deliver it with their own ability. It's not like they go into a trance and they don't know what they are saying. The Bible says that the that that the spirit of the subject, the uh, spirit of the prophets, are subject to the prophet. You, it's not like you're going into a weird trance. You know exactly what you're saying. Now, when I prophesy, very often I don't know what I'm going to say until I start saying it, which sounds a bit. Backward, but that's the way it works for me. I've heard some people say they can read it word for word like a scroll. I'm thinking, oh, wouldn't that be great? I keep praying, Lord, let that happen to me. But I just get this urge to prophesy to a situation or to someone. And as I speak, God kind of, that's faith. That's how it works. But it's spontaneous. Visions. Some people come with visions. Ananias, remember, uh, had a vision. Isaiah. Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. The whole book of Revelation is about John having a vision and birthed out of that all kinds of revelations began to flow. Dreams. Joseph had dreams. 
Aaron and Miriam, after they crossed over the Red Sea in Numbers 12, uh, the Lord spoke in that, in that cloud of presence and says, I spoke to them in dreams. So you can get a dream. I suppose the definition of a dream is something that comes to you when you're asleep, and a vision is something that comes to you when you're awake, really. Then there's angelic visitations, Acts 10, Peter, Revelation, John, the whole book of Revelation is about angelic visitations coming, discerning of spirits, incidentally. I haven't got time to go into all the others, but just suffice it to say that prophecy is something that should be a vibrant part of the life of every single Christian. The key verse for the church to understand is what is the purpose of prophecy? This is more important than anything else. It's for edification, exhortation, and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. Edification means to build up as in building a house. Exhortation means calling to one side. And then comfort, of course, is to draw near, speaking of soothing and so on. So another way of defining it is to say it this way. This is what prophecy does. It builds up, it stirs up, and it lifts up. That's what it does. It builds up, it stirs up, and it lifts up. That's what prophecy is all about. It's to encourage, to comfort, to confirm, to exhort. As prophecy is to be encouraged then, we've got to recognize its dangers. Now, just very quickly, who judges prophecy? Well, I put four categories down here. Every believer, every one of us can judge prophecy. Because the Bible says in 1 John 1, 20 to 27, it says that we all have an inner witness. I guarantee there's been times when you've been in a meeting and, and something you've gone, ooh, oh. Because your inner witness has witnessed with it. Right? So every believer... Then there's the witness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, sorry, there's the, then there's the elders or the leaders of the local church. 1 Timothy 5, 2 Timothy 4, Hebrews 13. They are there to govern and to protect and to guard. And so the leaders of the church have the responsibility to make sure that everything is being done decently and in order. Who else judges prophecy? Those with the gift of the discerning of spirits. You remember that they can see the source of where a manifestation is coming from. And then, of course, the prophets themselves. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. So, but how do we judge prophecy? Well, we judge it, first of all, by the word of God. If it's contrary to God's word, it's a false prophecy. That's it. Quite simple. By the witness of the Spirit, we've already referred to that. By the test of 1 John 4, 1 to 3, is Jesus Lord, is Jesus honored? Because if he's not, it's a false prophecy. We can judge it by its fruit. You know, a prophecy should never condemn. Prophecy is not there to, to expose sin. Prophecy is not there to, to look with the BDI of correction. Now, I know prophets can bring correction, but there's a way of doing that, actually. But that's not what prophecy is there for. It's not there to, to be angry, to, to abs, have, a, have a paddy over something. And really use prophecy to, to speak to people? No. And of course, another way we judge prophecy, if it contains some revelatory gifts, is if it comes to pass. And so with regard to prophecy, let's remember Paul's exhortation that every single one of us should seek after this and cover to prophesy. Now, that's the theory. That's the, the, the message is over. But here's the thing. The last thing I want you to do now is to forget about it. Think, oh, yeah, okay, I understand that. That's good. Let's prophesy. Yeah. Let's just do it. You know, and do you know the best way, you look at this in your life groups this week. Incidentally, if you're not part of a life group, get into one. Yeah. We want to put the high value on life groups because that's where you do life together, yeah. right? But the best place is in life groups where you learn and you, and you practice these things, but also just get out there and take a step. And uh, you will be amazed at what God will do to you. The greatest honor on the face of the earth is we've been singing about it this morning, is that we are children of God. We're children of God. 
That means, I, I am a child of God. That means we have personal dialogue with our Heavenly Father. That's it. The greatest, the greatest honor, the greatest privilege is that we have a Heavenly Father. And we can talk to Him every single day, every moment of the day. He's there. And what we need to do is, as Bill Johnson puts it in his book, you know, bring heaven, heaven down onto us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And God wants us to live naturally every single day of our lives in dialogue with him. That's really where it starts. And when you begin to speak out what God is telling you, you begin to prophesy. That's what it is. So in your workplace, you don't need to go to the person sitting in the desk next to you and say, well... I've got a word from God for you. And so this is what the Lord says. And start to preach and close your eyes. No, you can, you can just say, you know, I want to encourage you with something. Yeah. I, think, I think you're going to do great in this because this, 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 and this. Yeah. Now, without, without actually saying it, you are prophesying. Yeah. Right. You're being natural. You're releasing the Word of God. And the more you read the Word of God, the more God's Word will be in you. And I guarantee it will be released when you speak to people. That's how we release the prophetic voice of God through the church to the world. But how many of us do it? Every conversation you have with somebody, think, what are you saying here, Lord? And sometimes, just by listening to what they say, will open a door for you to say something as a word from God. You don't need to say, I have a word from God for you. It will frighten people away. But actually, that's what prophecy is. We're going to change the world. And we do that by getting out with people and taking bold steps to see the prophetic word released. Amen?